So I'm going to tell you just a little bit of background about the social gospel movement. And then you are going to hear from Bruce and then Catherine about two particular people who made different kinds of contributions to this movement. So throughout American history, religions always played a part in social reform. And the, this particular movement came out of the late 19th and early 20th centuries when industrialization was going on in this country. And the people in the churches, many of the Protestant churches, were becoming quite aware of lots and lots of injustices affecting poor people. I mean, some of the basic things were they simply did not have enough to eat. They had no uh, guarantees if they lost their job or got hurt on the job. And they were basically taken advantage of. So a number of Protestant churches uh, jumped into this as well as social workers and others to try to address these issues. And so just to fast forward a second, um, this movement is very much with us today. In fact, I think we heard some of that in our service in the words we say every Sunday, but we don't usually refer to it as social gospel. And as Unitarian Universalists, we don't refer to the gospel part as often, but so we're gonna touch on that today. Um, I do want to note that today some of those issues have changed and some of them are still with us. We will touch on those in a few moments. I also wanted to tell you why I read the story I did. I felt very much that Muhammad Yunus's work with the Village Bank very much fit the theme of social gospel, but he was Muslim. And so it's not something that's just part of Christianity, both Protestants and Catholics, but it's part of religious thinking from all over the world. So what is this religious thinking about? Well, the idea is, first of all, you've, you've heard about seeking individual salvation um, to enter the kingdom of God. Well, the people advocating the social gospel said that we should be thinking more about salvation in terms of betterment of the society we're in. So this is an interpretation of the Bible which gets some of these folks in trouble later. But they were particularly focused on the biblical principles of charity and justice. So in the US, um, uh, after World War, or excuse me, prior to World War I, the social gospel was actually a, a considered the religious wing of the progressive movement. So progressive movement, we think about that, we think about a lot of rules about, um, about in industry and trying to control monopolies and things like that, but it also was a time when labor unions rose and ideas about education changed um, and so on. And so this was a biblical foundation for some of the things that happened during the progressive movement. Um, and interestingly, I think, in 1930s and 40s, some of these ideals were actually put into place by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt through the New Deal. There was just a really good fit there. So today, as I said, we don't use that term social gospel much anymore, but we do have a very active liberal religious left. And I think we will find that there's a lot of uh, connections between those two. So as I mentioned, a big part of this movement was advocacy for the poor. Um, the cities that were overcrowded, disease was such an issue. Um, Keep the immigrants coming, speaking different languages. A particularly hard hit were women and children. And so the Protestant faith was key here in, in developing this movement. However, it ran into trouble with the more conservative element of Christianity, revivalism, which felt that this was being too free with the interpretation of the Bible. And if you wanted to get to heaven, it was very much an individual uh, act um, that you needed to think about just, I mean, I mean, I shouldn't say think about, but focus on just um, yourself 
um, and accepting Jesus and those kinds of things. And that didn't quite fit with these other folks who are saying, wait a minute, we need to go out and help people. That's part of what the gospel is telling us to do, not just, not just think about ourselves. And so, um, as I mentioned, labor reforms came out of this uh, emphasis. Um, there was a uh, minister, uh, an, a German-American named Walter Rauschenbusch. I didn't have to tell you he was German, did I? Um, anyway, he was a, a Baptist minister, uh, and he's one who was one of the leaders espousing this particular uh, point of view. And so as a result of his work, he attracted a lot of other ministers, uh, of mostly Protestant, and they were one of the forces behind getting rid of child labor, between uh, raising the um, minimum wage, things like that. I have to think about that, though, in terms of something more local. Some of you may know I'm thinking about Butte, America, because that is a was a hotbed of labor activity. Some of it was definitely connected to religion, um, but also some of it was connected not to the Protestant religion, but to the Catholic religion. So there were also folks there who were working on some of these reforms. So some other folks that are important and you're gonna hear more about today, philosopher and theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, Reverend Henry Emerson Fosdick of the Riverside Church in New York City, Martin Luther King Jr., who was effect, uh, I'm influenced by Rauschenbusch, Fostick, and Niebuhr, and Reverend William Barber, who is very much with us today and very active, minister from North Carolina. I wanted to say just a couple words about um, Henry Fosdick, or yeah, because I thought his story was kind of interesting. He was at New York's Riverside Church, which is now a an interdenominational church with the United Church of Christ and the Baptists. And he was there in the 30s and 40s. But part of the reason he's important is that he had such an influence on King. We may not hear of Fosdick, but we hear some of his ideas coming through King's preaching. And here's a quote from him that I liked. Um, this is from Fosdick. That, um, excuse me, he felt that a church that pretends to care for the souls of people but is not interested in the slums that damn them, the city government that corrupts them, the economic order that cripples them, and the international relationships that lead to peace or war determine the spiritual destiny of innumerable souls, and that those who did not pay attention to those conditions would receive divine condemnation. So his words were pretty strong. Um, Bruce is gonna tell us a little bit about Reinhold Niebuhr in a few moments, but he was an urban pastor in Detroit, which I did not know, which also helps explain to me some of his connections with this movement. Um, I also wanted to say, as I just alluded to, Protestants weren't the only one, but it, the, the term social gospel is embedded in the Protestant tradition. However, at the same time, Catholics were realizing a lot of these same issues that were going on. In fact, even in 1891, Pope Leo XIII critiqued both socialism and unfettered capitalism. So that's the Catholic religion's take on that, just a little bit different. And some of the folks that came out of that that worked for social justice and particularly economic justice were people like Dorothy Day, the Berrigan brothers, many of us who have been around a while know them from the Vietnam War, and Cesar Chavez. Um, also some of the Catholic work that fits in this is the work of Paulo Freire from uh, South America and liberation theology, plus, as I said, the work of Franklin Roosevelt in setting up the New Deal. The civil rights movement obviously has a strong connection here. Uh, it's interesting, a, a work that I use in a class I teach, all of us do, is Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham Jail. And when he, in that letter, he really gets on the ministers for not stepping forward and a addressing these injustices, and guess what? That is all coming from this. You can't just sit back and let things go by and maybe somebody else will pick it up, but he's saying ministers have a special duty to step in and address hatred, racial injustice, economic injustice. Um, 
he, of course, was assassinated. And as time went on, the other side of another interpretation of, of some of these things about getting into the kingdom of God started to take hold. And I have not enough time to go into a <laughs> long uh, discussion about fundamentalism. But fundamentalism, in some ways, is the opposite of what we're talking about, because it's so focused on a literal interpretation of the Bible and focused on the individual salvation. So. Um, a final word uh, before I turn this over to Bruce is um, that the battle taking place today, and many of us ask questions like, how does this fit Christianity? What some folks are espousing who say they're very strong Christians. Well, I think there's some roots here that help us understand those difficult, diff different philosophical uh, directions. So, although the, so, the term social gospel is no longer in currency, the impulse remains with the charitable works of religious people throughout America. A powerful voice for that uh, we'll hear from in a few minutes, Reverend William Barber, but we're also going to hear about Reinhold Niebuhr, one of my favorite people, and a strong influence on Martin Luther King. I'd heard of the social gospel, and I thought I knew what it was all about, but I was wrong. Preparing for this service, I learned a lot, and I'm eager to share that with you today. In essence, as Sandra talked about, the term refers to a movement that uses Christian ethics to address social justice issues, including economic inequality, alcoholism, okay, good. Um, crime, racial tensions, slums, the unclean environment, child labor, lack of unionization, and poor schools. The driving tenet is that Christians should be motivated by the teachings of Jesus to take care of the poor and suffering, working from the framework, what would Jesus do? This stands in direct opposition to social Darwinism. That is, those who are poor must deserve to be so, and therefore, they don't need any help from society. We have heard that the concept grew out of changes accompanying the Industrial Revolution, and it was developed and propagated through the Protestant denominations, and has influenced religion and politics to this day. I want to focus on a person integral not to the origin story, but hugely important to its development. Reinhold Niebuhr was a Lutheran minister called to serve a congregation in Detroit. And at that time, Detroit was the fourth largest city in the United States. And it was a melting pot for people of various cultures and beliefs. When the concept of the social gospel was introduced, Niebuhr was an early adopter. However, witnessing the effects of industrialization on the workers at the Ford plant, he grew concerned that the owners were thriving while the workers labored under increasingly stressful conditions. So this is a, a entry that Niebuhr made. We went through one of the big automobile factories today. The foundry interested me particularly. The heat was terrific. The men seemed weary. Here, manual labor is a drudgery and toil is slavery. The men cannot possibly find any satisfaction in their work they simply work to make a living. Their sweat and their dull pain are part of the price paid for the fine cars that we all run. And most of us run the cars without knowing what price is being paid for them. We are all responsible. We all want the things which the factory produces, and none of us is sensitive enough to care how much. In Sorry, I'm out of order here. In human values, the efficiency of modern factory costs. So that's the end of his entry. Motivated by the tenets of the social gospel, Niebuhr worked with his congregation to effect change. His work in Detroit brought increasing recognition and led to his appointment to be a professor at the Union Theological Seminary in New York City. He spent the rest of his career there, teaching, developing his ideas, and writing. In 
as the application of the social gospel was applied to increasingly complex issues, conflicts naturally arose. Communism and the conditions leading to World War II were a growing concern, and the pacifism called for by the social gospel proponents struck Niebuhr as just too naive. His study of the situation resulted in a, his support of a new movement termed Christian realism. While still a believer in the message instilled in the social gospel, Niebuhr believed there comes a time when action is not only an option, but is necessary. Niebuhr couched his ideas in Christ-centered principles such as the great commandment and the doctrine of original sin. His major contribution was his view of sin as a social event, as pride, with selfish, self-centeredness as the root of evil. The sin of pride was apparent not just in criminals, but more dangerously in people who felt good about their deeds, rather like Henry Ford, whom he did not mention by name. The human tendency to corrupt the good was the great insight he saw manifested in governments, business, democracies, utopian societies, and churches. This position is laid out profoundly in one of his most influential books in 1932, entitled Moral Man and Immoral Society. Niebuhr has inspired a wide range of critical thinkers, from Martin Luther King to Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. This is taken from a paper in, from Stanford about Martin Luther King. King always claimed to have been more influenced by Niebuhr than by Gandhi. He considered his nonviolent technique to be a Niebuhrian strategy of power. Whenever there was a conversation about power, Niebuhr came up. Niebuhr kept us from being naive about the evil structures of society. So then what's the connection to you use? A primary goal for the Sunday Services Committee is to choose speakers or to use materials that demonstrate at least one of our principles. As I look at Niebuhr's body of work, I see elements of all of our principles. His involvement in economic fairness, racial inequality, religious tolerance, support of democratic principles cover most of our core beliefs. Niebuhr attributed the injustices of society to human pride and self-love, and believed that this innate propensity for evil could not be controlled by humanity. But he believed that a representative democracy could improve society's ills. His willingness to question and sometimes reverse previous positions based on consideration of new information is an example for all of us on our free and responsible search for truth and meaning. I'll turn it over to Catherine. Thank you, Bruce and uh, Sandra. Good morning, I'm Catherine Homan. I'm subbing today for Carolyn Widman, who couldn't be here uh, today. So these are uh, Carolyn's thoughts. Um, but I'm Catherine Homan, and I approve this message. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to refresh us all on a few UU sources, uh, two in particular today. Quote, the words and deeds of all prophetic women and men which challenges us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. And also, the quote, Jewish and Christian teachings which call upon us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors. This is your heads up right now that we're gonna talk a little Bible today. Uh, we're gonna have Old and New Testament, just so you know what's coming. I'd like to introduce you to a contemporary practitioner of the social gospel, Dr. Reverend William J. Barber and the amazing work that he is doing right now in the present. Reverend Barber has multiple degrees through a divinity doctorate from three universities. He was the president of the North Carolina NAACP, the second largest in the nation, and he currently serves on the national NAACP board. He was the minister at the Greenleaf Christian Church in Goldsboro, North Carolina from 93 to 2023. 
He uh, delivered the sermon at President Biden's inaugural service in 2020. He currently is a professor and founding director of the Center for Public Theology and Public Policy at Yale Divinity School. He serves as president and senior lecturer of Repairers of the Breach and co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. Whew, that's a lot to be doing. The Poor People's Campaign, along with his earlier Moral Monday campaigns are social justice movements, which term Reverend Barber calls moral fusion. He's marched and marched and marched in many states and in the nation's capital. And all the while he practices what he preaches as reflected by Luke's words. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressor, oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I've seen photos of Reverend Barber at some of these marches wearing a stole that says, Jesus was a poor man. He, like the others we have heard about today, is a living example of WWJD. And no, that's not what would Jerry Garcia do? I also feel that Reverend Barber is heavily influenced by the prophetic traditions along the lines of Jesus, obviously, but also Jeremiah, Amos, Micah, and especially Isaiah. Prophets, as you might remember from some of our excellent tutelage from Rabbi Ed, were the ones chosen by God to speak to power and evil, which were the kings and priests of the suffering of the regular people. Isaiah was no stranger to poverty, and he was familiar with the poor, the sick, the unprotected, the widowed, the orphaned, the dispossessed, homeless, landless, and with the, quote, resourceless victims of the moneyed man's court. Does this sound like our current time? I feel that this prophetic voice is in Reverend Barber, although he might not be thrilled to be deemed a prophet. Reverend Barber has recently released his co-published sixth book entitled White Poverty, How Exposing the Myths About Race and Class Can Reconstruct American Democracy. A book on white poverty written by a black preacher? Reverend Barber says in his book, quote, I cannot be a moral leader and only stand up for black people. As a black man in America, I have to confront white poverty to penetrate the veil of racism and in and turn old myths on their heads. Reverend Barber shares some facts about poverty. And this is where I just have really uh, been surprised to learn uh, what he is saying to us all. Did you know that 66 million white people are poor? And 24 million black people? When you add these numbers together with the other poor minorities, you get 140 million poor people. That is 43% of the United States population. As researched by and defined by Reverend Barber, poor are those living paycheck to paycheck who would not be able to meet their expenses if they had a $400 emergency. This is not how our government defines poor. Poor is an income of $14,000 per year or $28,000 for a family of four, and thus only makes up 11% of the United States population. So why aren't all these poor white people standing up for change? Because they believe in myths that Reverend Barber believes that have been also used by those in power to stay in power, by which Barber means politicians and immoral religious leaders. These myths are also used to make the rich even richer and the poor unempowered. Barbara believes, as I do, that we don't lack the ability to, to abolish poverty, but we need to find a way up through these barriers, including these myths. He addresses these myths in his book by research, outreach, and action. Myth number one is pale skin is a shared interest from Reverend Barber. This is the story Americans told themselves to explain why the use and economic exploitation of black people was good, just, and even righteous. To get buy-in from black people's potential allies among their fellow servants, this story had to include the myth that pale skin is a shared interest. So this is why poor white people believe they have more in common 
with politicians who refuse to expand Medicaid than they do with poor people, even if they, there would be benefit for all. By the way, this history was reflected in Rabbi Ed's Freedom Sermon last week, and 1619 is a very key date in this myth. The other myths are even more self-explanatory. Myth number two, only black folks want change in America. Myth number three, poverty is only a black issue. Myth number four, we can't overcome division. I greatly admire Reverend Barber's leadership, his compassion, and his heart. He seeks out the poor white people and listens to their stories, even in places that a black man would fear to tread. These stories make me cry, by the way. He literally walks into the forest to meet poor white families who are living in tents. He shares statistics, prayer, and song with those who, on the surface, have not one thing in common with him but addressing poverty. And from that, along with his co-leaders of all skin colors, formed a, a poor people's movement that got out the vote in 2016 and 2020 to get their voices heard for a better minimum wage, for health care, for support for unions, and acknowledgement and justice for the poor. Reverend Barber shined the light on how political, act, po political policy has led to the unnecessary deaths of millions of poor people. Policy deaths, he calls them. For example, the result when Medicaid expansion was not adopted by some states and the lack of nearby available health care during COVID-19. I'd like to close with a quote from Reverend Barber's sermon at President uh, Biden's inaugural service. If you loose the bands of wickedness, Isaiah says, a phrase that some of my rabbi friends say is best translated from the Hebrew as, if you pay people a living wage, if you care for the poor and make them the center of your attention, if you even invite them into your home and treat them like family, the prophet says, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will be complete. Only then, Isaiah says, will you be called a repairer of the breach. I highly suggest reading his book. He's also been interviewing with the book release, and you can even find one on NPR broadcast on June 28. So, WWBD, what would Barber do? What would you do? What will you do? Go in peace and in service. Thank you.